Hey guys, Brutal here. In my previous video, I explained how to start the Underrot dungeon, what each NPC would do upon engaging them in combat, and how to murder Elder Lieksa without seeing yourself be murdered in the process. Now that you've killed Elder Lieksa, the first boss of the dungeon, it's time to start making your way to Kragmaw the Infested. As always, keep in mind this is not a one-size-fits-all guide, as each week's affixes will alter the routes, pull patterns, crowd control, and much more. So please use this as a general guide and consider what changes do take place from week to week to give yourself a competitive edge when a particularly difficult collection of affixes are present. Much like at the beginning of the dungeon, you will be greeted by a large pack of underrot ticks, but it also has a fetid maggot attached to the pole. Most groups opt to skip this pack of trash due to the sheer amount of damage that is placed upon the party, so remember, the underrot ticks upon death deal damage to everyone in the area. Not to mention the fetid maggot needs to be stunned to prevent its rotten bile cast. Instead, you might choose to charge straight ahead and pull an equally difficult pack, which includes two feral blood swarmers, an NPC you've yet to face in the dungeon. This NPC has two abilities to watch out for, Sonic Screech, and Thirst for Blood. Sonic Screech is an interruptible spell, but if you fail to interrupt it, it will deal moderate damage to your party. The real danger of Sonic Screech, however, is that it will lock the spellcasters in your group out of a school of magic if they were casting when it goes off. In other words, if your Restoration Druid is casting Wild Growth or Regrowth when Sonic Screech finishes casting, kiss your heels goodbye for a few seconds. Three to be precise. So either interrupt Sonic Screech, or don't be casting when it goes off. Thirst for Blood, however, can prove to be a nightmare if not handled appropriately. This ability will force the Feral Blood Swarmer to fixate on a single player for 15 seconds. While the Thirst for Blood debuff is running its course, most of the attacks made by the Feral Blood Swarmer will be considered shadow damage, with the occasional physical melee swing occurring as well. This means you can counter the damage in a variety of ways, such as using a Monk's Ring of Peace to prevent the mob from even reaching you, popping defensive cooldowns such as Repost, or even Cloak of Shadows as a rogue. You can also stun the NPC, you can knock it back with a Druid's Typhoon, you can Death Grip it if you're a Death Knight, using Blessing of Protection if you're a Paladin, and so on and so forth. The NPC forces the group to think about how your party needs to stay alive. So don't just expect the healer to heal through the damage. Work together, Keep the targeted player alive, and I promise this portion of the dungeon will go much smoother. All of that being said, you can actually skip this pack of trash as well. Surprise! And you can elect to run right up the middle, ignoring every NPC in this area. It's really quite handy, and it's usually advised, especially during teaming weeks, when the double Pharaoh Blood Swarmer pack has four additional NPCs attached to the bowl, bringing the total up to seven. To be clear, there's actually a fetid maggot with the two feral blood swarmers, but you already know how to handle that NPC based on my previous underwrite video, so I didn't mention it until now. So let's say you do run up the middle and you skip the underwrite ticks on the left, and you skip the feral blood swarmers on the right, what are you greeted by? Well, a roaming pair of diseased lashers is directly to your right, and a pack of three living rot NPCs is right in front of you. By this point in the dungeon, you've killed or skipped 25 to 35 percent of the enemy force count you need to complete the keystone. And once again, this is the power of method dungeon tools. That being said, planning your route using MDT before you even begin the dungeon can almost guarantee that you are not overpulling or underpulling. With the NPCs you can stealth or invis by, and other NPCs you can simply avoid. What should you even be pulling to reach 100%? Well, rest easy, because there are plenty of NPCs not only in this next room, but there are plenty ahead, period, for the rest of the dungeon. For now, I'll simply say you'll basically want to pull everything in front of you. But again, use method dungeon tools to have a better understanding of what you're killing and what you're skipping. Getting back to the two new NPCs you're facing, let's cover the patrolling pack of diseased lashers first. These NPCs have a single ability, but boy, is it ever annoying. It's called Decaying Mind, and it is classified as a disease. 
If this spell ever lands on a player, it becomes a problem. So as always, interrupting it, stunning the NPC, knocking the NPC back, etc., is the easiest way to avoid frustration and problems. But for the sake of educating, let's say this spell does land on a player. What does it do? How do you handle it? The spell itself isn't all that dangerous. The problem stems from the fact that you're stunned for a whopping 24 seconds with no ability and no chance to move out of any other deadly mechanics like Sanguine in the ground, Volcanic Orb during Volcanic Week. What if the Pharaoh Blood Swarmer decides to put Thirst of Blood on you? You're done. I'm sure you can see the issues that can arise from being stunned for such a long duration. God forbid it lands in your healer with no way to remove it, or if one or two DPS players get locked down for that long, prolonging damage being applied to the tank, the group as a whole, you get the idea. That being said, with the spell being a disease, monks can use detox, paladins can cleanse, priests have purify, even dwarves have the racial stone form. There are ways to break out of it or to get people out of it. On top of that, you could also simply heal the debuff off, as once the amount of damage the debuff absorbs has been applied to the player, the debuff fades away. Of course, the higher the keystone, the more healing that it takes to remove the debuff. Ultimately, if you're in Discord with your group, coordinating who is CCing which target and staying on top of them goes a long way. Moving on to the Living Rot NPCs, they have two abilities to watch out for, Wave of Decay and Foul Sludge. Wave of Decay is handled by simply moving out of the green stuff on the ground. Foul Sludge requires you to observe where a green spell effect will be landing in your general area. Interrupt whatever you can from these guys as long as a higher priority spell, such as a diseased Lasher's Decaying Mind, is also not going off at the same time. This NPC is one of the lesser evils of the dungeon, so as long as you can avoid standing in anything green, you'll be fine. Just make sure you're not mistaking a Resto Druid's efflorescence as a damaging ability, as I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate you missing out on some passive healing. I got you, Druids. Don't worry. I got you. One thing I should mention is that the general practice of this dungeon sees groups spending 10 minutes clearing trash between pulling the first boss, Elder Lyexa, and engaging the second boss, Kragmaw the Infested. Why? Because Kragmaw the Infested is a healing intensive fight, so most groups opt to kill him sooner rather than later, and Bloodlust helps in this regard big time. All you need to do to safely engage Kragmaw is clear the room of NPCs. This is not required per se, but it's a good idea due to how easy the trash is and how much it's worth for your total enemy force count. There's no specific style of pulling this room, just don't over pull. Oh, and be sure to stun and interrupt and so on and so forth. You don't want those casts going off. Let as few of those casts go off as possible. And if you find the room empty of trash, but the sated debuff is still afflicting you, feel free to pull more trash between the second and third boss of the instance. This will buy or save you some time, depending upon how you want to look at it. However, I won't be reviewing the NPCs ahead in this video, as they are more relevant for the next video in the series. Once you have the ability to cast and use Bloodlust, make your way to Kragma the Infested and make sure the group is ready to engage. Most groups choose to pull and position Kragmaw next to a rib cage found in the room, but it's not necessary. The reason groups do this is due to one of his abilities called Charge, which sees Kragmaw turn toward a player in the group and, well, charge at them. Strafe out of this ability as if it hits you, it will deal copious amounts of damage, knocking you back and away from the group in the process. If players put their backs against the rib cage, Forcing Kragma to run into it, he stops abruptly and remains within melee and casting range more easily. Feel free to use this tactic if you think it's worthwhile, but again, it's not necessary. Another ability of Kragma's is called Indigestion. You'll often see Protection Warriors leaping backwards to avoid this ability, but tanks can actually and quite literally walk away from Kragma right before this ability is cast to completely avoid taking damage from it. Literally just walk away, that, that's it. You're welcome. 
Now you may notice a bunch of larvae on the ground. Wait, 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 larvae? Yeah, ap apparently that's the proper way to pronounce the plural of larva. I googled it. Anyway, when Kragma vomits or charges, you need to run over each larva that lands on the ground around the boss. Mobile classes like Beast Mastery Hunters, Restoration Druids, and the like are good choices to pick up most of them. But everyone should be making an effort to gather them. Melee and the tank cover the ones closest to the boss. Everyone else covers the larvae further out. If a larva spends enough time on the ground, eight seconds to be specific, without being stomped on, a blood tick spawns. And it essentially has the exact same abilities as the underrot ticks do earlier in the dungeon. You'll be dealing with a stacking dot on whoever has aggro, and when they die, they do deal group-wide shadow damage. And believe me, this fight already applies enough pressure on your healer, so do everyone a favor and simply walk over the larvae. The last ability that Kragma uses is called Tantrum, which sees him rampaging and running around the room for six seconds. While he's tantruming and causing tremendous amounts of damage to the group, he's also throwing larvae around the entire room which is one of the reasons why you cleared the room of trash before you engage the boss. We'll touch on dealing with the larvae in a moment. As I said a moment ago, Tantrum deals a ton of damage, and it's classified as physical damage. So use whatever defensive abilities you have to mitigate the damage. Druids have bark skin, rogues have faint, hunters have aspect of the turtle, and so on and so forth. This is where your healer will be pushed to his or her limit. So be prepared to use healing cooldowns to get your group through this portion of the fight. And the boss will be tantruming multiple times before he dies. Usually two or three times, depending upon how much damage your group is capable of doing. I'm not a healer at heart, but when I am on my Restoration Druid, I'll pre-hot my group with Rejuve, Regrowth, Wild Growth, whatever I have available, use Flourish, Spot Heal as needed. I'm usually capable of stomping on Larvae at this point in the time, but I go with the flow. The next tantrum, I'll pre-hot again and use Tranquility. If a third tantrum occurs, I'll lean on my Trinket or my Troll Racial Berserking to get the group through the large damage output, but it's just as important for the group to be doing whatever they can to help their healer. Healthstones from Warlocks, Abyssal Healing Potions, which can be crafted by Alchemists or purchased off the Auction House, Rogues can use Crimson Vial, Hunters can use Exhilaration, you get the idea. As for the larvae that spawn around the room, a good way to approach this portion of the fight is to assign one quadrant to the tank and the other three quadrants to the three DPS players. Have anyone with movement speed abilities, like a rogue using sprint, hunter using aspect of the cheetah, etc., go farther than the slower classes. Stomp each larva, and when everything is stomped or spawned, it's a rinse and repeat encounter. Kill those blood ticks if they do spawn, but other than that, get in the boss, and avoid his damage. Congratulations, you have now killed two of four bosses in the Underrot. If you have any additional tips or tricks you think I missed, please let me know in the comments below. Also, do not be afraid to ask for clarification in a future video. My name is Brutal. Feel free to share this video and the rest of my Mythic Plus guides with your guild, communities, and friends. And as always, be well. Thank <laughs> you.